been chosen as the location for 6,000 wind turbines. It's part of a massive project which could provide a quarter of the country's electricity within a decade. But how green are the turbines and can the huge cost really be justified? John's been to investigate. A blade beats to the rhythm of the wind. But this isn't a steady pulse. As the breeze ebbs and surges, so too does the energy flowing from the sea to the mainland. So should these imposing structures be at the heart of our future energy supply? For the past 10 years, offshore wind farms have been springing up. Already there are 11 of them, and soon there'll be more. Licenses have just been granted, allowing developers to build on nine new sites around our seas. But what are these power stations out at sea like, really close up? I'm going to take a look. This is Gunfleet Sands, more than four miles off the coast of Essex. It's the newest offshore wind farm in Britain. Just to get things into perspective, each tower is 85 metres tall, and each blade is 52 metres. So when a blade is at the top, each structure is as high as the London Eye. There are 48 turbines on this farm, and I'm heading for its high-tech hub. Well, this is the only structure on the wind farm that doesn't have blades, so what's going on there? Absolutely. This is the substation. This is where all the electricity from the 48 turbines is collected together and then transformed, uh, ready for the voltage for the national grid. How much electricity could this farm produce, then? Uh, this wind farm, when it's fully operational, will produce enough electricity for 120,000 homes. Well, the whole process of building a wind farm out here uh, must have been an incredibly difficult uh, technical challenge. You're building a wind farm in a very hostile environment. Obviously, the best place for a wind farm is a windy site, but that is one of the most difficult places to actually build a wind farm. Is it all going to be worth it, all that effort and expense? Oh, yes. Um, this site will... Um, it's taken about just over a year to, to, to build, but it will generate clean, green electricity for another 25 years. This wind farm is big, but the newest ones planned are going to be huge. The largest on Dogger Bank would cover an area the size of North Yorkshire and could produce 9,000 megawatts. That's nine times the output of an average coal or gas-powered station. But they're expensive, around three times as much as onshore wind farms. The total cost of all the new sites will be about £100 billion. Campaigner Dr John Constable thinks this money will be better spent on mixing together a variety of energy sources. What do you make of these massive plans for an expansion of offshore power? Well-meaning, but unrealistic, unfortunately, John. In what Go way? Government projections for the capacities for offshore wind are so high that they're very unlikely to be built in time, and the cost of managing wind fleets of that size will also be very, very high indeed. The cost of the consumer will be significant. But is it a price we'll have to pay? Because we do need a lot more green energy, don't we? Exactly. But uh, if you spend money on, on one technology, you're obviously not spending it on others. And there are very good reasons for thinking there are other technology mixes. Wind will have a role to play. 10,000 megawatts of wind, possibly. This wind farm here is 170. But 30,000 megawatts, as government is projecting, is unrealistic. So do you feel that too much has been placed uh, on the potential of wind power? Yes, they're being unrealistic about that. But faced with these impossible targets, governments all over Europe are flailing around to trying to seem to appear to be doing a job. They're trying to look as if they're actually doing something significant. But really, the targets are unattainable. We have to be much more clear-headed and rational about this. is engineering, not emotion. But the British Wind Energy Association told me they believe Dr Constable has got his figures wrong. They say the target set by the government is subject to planning permission, both realistic and achievable. Meanwhile, the energy regulator, Ofgem, is warning of a massive crisis ahead unless there's more incentive to invest in a wide range of energy sources, including tidal and wind. Whatever the right mix turns out to be, the current focus is on offshore wind, and one part of the country aims to make the most of that.
This huge new investment in offshore wind farming is going to bring great opportunities in the fields of industry and technology. And I've travelled now 300 miles from Essex to the northeast of England, which was home to the country's very first offshore wind farm a few years ago, and which is now determined to grab as much as possible of that new business. And the company that built the first is now going to build the largest in the world. The new turbine will make even these blades look small. So give me some idea of the size of the turbines that you're planning. Well, John, you've just been offshore at uh, Gumpley Sands. You've seen the turbines there. Ours are going to be 40 metres taller than that. This blade here is only about 45 metres long. Ours will be about one and a half times the length of this. The biggest blade currently being designed and built in the world. So why so big? Well, the project sites are going to be far offshore. So we've got to go out there, we've got to be cost effective. We've got to find the best way of making an, an efficient installation, uh, get the cheapest cost of electricity to bring back to the mainland. Well, it's going to be an awful long cable, isn't it? <laughs> it will be a long cable, but there may be cables that go across from the UK to Europe, and we get flows of electricity going this way and that way. So, looking to the future, you know, we need a, a much more global and a European approach to our energy future. Well, I've been hearing criticism that uh, uh, too much is being invested into offshore wind power. It's too many eggs in one basket. Well, I, I think enough is being invested into offshore wind. I think more has to be invested into other areas, and that includes, you know, just energy efficiency as well as the other technologies. But it's not reliable, is it? The turbines aren't always turning. Well, what we will have are wind farms from uh, the west coast to the east coast to the south up to Scotland. The wind varies all the time. We will get a consistent amount of power coming from all of the turbines into the grid. This is a new breed of engineer working as offshore maintenance crews. No matter which way the wind blows, turbines at sea are going to mean more employment, building them and keeping them working. The government says that 70,000 new jobs are going to be created. Good news for these students who are training to be turbine technicians. I did it because I was interested in renewables and it seems like a really hands-on thing to be doing. So do you think there's a real future now in offshore wind technology? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. With the, um, the government having granted all licences two or three weeks ago for 6,500 new turbines, there's got to be a future. Once they've qualified, successful students will be giving up the workshop for this. It's the only college in the country to run a course in wind power maintenance. So they've got a guarantee of a job, have they, these guys? Well, guarantees are, are difficult things to, to have, but there is a great deal of interest in this course and a lot of the students from our previous course have been very successful and are working in the industry at the moment. But it's not just training and industry that's seeing the potential. This research facility in Blythe tests prototype wind turbines. The North East has a real record of doing very, very difficult engineering in very, very hazardous conditions. And by the time you're out at Dogger Bank, 150 kilometres offshore, it's hazardous and it's difficult. And inevitably, it's windy because that's why they're going to be uh, located where they are, where there's more reliable wind source. Is the skill still there? Definitely, because although the heyday of shipbuilding's passed quite a long time ago, there's a real record of offshore oil and gas construction on the Tyne and on the Tees. And it's those kind of skills that are going to be required and that expertise that's going to be required to take turbines way offshore. Green energy is expensive and it's we consumers who foot the bill. Benefits for areas like the North East are clear. What's not so clear is exactly where the billions being invested in green energy should go. But an answer has to be found. Fossil fuels and time are running out.